Welcome everyone to Global Justice Now's webinar on women on the front line of the crisis. I will be facilitating this webinar today. My name is Dorothy Guerrero. I'm Head of Policy and Advocacy of Global Justice Now. Helping me remotely from our Edinburgh office is Jane Hersprit, a campaign officer in our Scotland team. I, do you see Jane? I see Jane, show yourself. Okay, hi Jane. Hi, sorry. Hi, Ron. <laughs> Hello. Um, this webinar is the second in our fortnightly series, Coronavirus, Capitalism and Inequality. The first webinar was held um, two, two weeks ago. It was called The Business as Usual, Is It Good Enough? Why Neoliberalism Won't Help the Global South Out of This Crisis. Part of which can now be accessed from our website as podcast and our Facebook page. As the COVID-19 virus continues to spread across the world, close to 4 billion people in over 90 countries are now under lockdown. As we speak today, more than 2.3 million people have been infected and the number of people who died are close to 200,000 globally. Apart from health impacts, the coronavirus pandemic is also exposing the systemic economic, social, environmental and gender injustices in our societies. It is unraveling and aggravating the brutal inequalities of capitalism between and within countries. It is exposing how patriarchy and racism set aside the importance of caring for people and nature. Through current division of labor, the burden of care work and child care often fall on women who had been and continue to be socially responsible for them. Frontline health workers, of which women make up the majority, are facing even greater exploitation with inadequate financial compensation for the risks they take and the responsibilities they have for others. In the UK alone, 98% of workers in high-risk jobs that are being paid poverty wages are women. At the same time, many of them are also migrants. From the daily news that we see, women living in the lockdown in the global south are experiencing far greater difficulties. In this webinar, I will be talking to the women from the global south who have been leading their organizations and campaigning for many years now to challenge the power structures that result in inequality for women and marginalized people. So I will be joined by Jean Enriquez, live from Manila, and Mauricio Andrews from Cape Town. They will both have 10 minutes to give a short presentation about the situation in their countries, after which we will have a Q&A. So I think Jean is back, but I can't see the video. So maybe I will reverse the, the order. I will first call on Mercia. So Mercia Andrews is the regional convener of the Rural Women's Assembly in South Africa. She's a feminist activist for a long, long, many, many years now, a veteran of the anti-apartheid struggle. She's deeply involved in the movement for land, agrarian, land and agrarian transformation in South Africa. So Mercia, you have the mic now. Thank you for having uh, me. Um, it's good to be uh, part of this conversation. This is a very important conversation. And uh, for us in, in South Africa and in Southern Africa, this is the fourth week of the lockdown. And it's been really challenging um, being in a lockdown. And I think uh, for those of us in different parts of our society, the lockdown has different implications. So I want to talk a little bit about the fact that in South Africa, um, we have a very top-down uh, lockdown. It's been mainly uh, driven by a military, uh, the military and the police, and our government has called the team of ministers that lead the um, response in South Africa, the command center. And the, the terminology is extremely male and patriarchal. We are in a, uh, in a war zone, we're fighting a war, and we need to um, use all the might of the state to fight this war, etc., etc. There's been very, very little attempt to win uh, support from below and to bring um, to ensure that people buy into the process. So this has been, um, this has been one of the, the big challenges. 
I think uh, like elsewhere in the world, South Africa is no different in that um, what has become clear is the challenges in the health system. We see a divided, uh, polarized health system. On the one hand, a very a well organized, like in your country, very well organized public uh, health, private health system where all the ventilators and the ICU beds are. And then you have the public sector that's under resourced uh, without proper um, equipment, all of those kinds of problems. Now imagine if these are the challenges of the health system in the urban areas, what are the problems in the rural areas? So in the rural areas where many people live, access to health is very extremely challenging. People have to travel long distances to get to the clinic. Clinics are under-resourced. Or if you're a farm worker, you have to wait for the mobile clinic uh, to, to come your way. So this has been quite a big challenge. And as you've said earlier in your introduction, many of the people working in the health system are, are women. And in our country, in the last period, because of the way in which um, health has been uh, privatized, we also see more and more of healthcare workers in the private sector. So there are many, many, the fault lines of the problems are, are being shown up. But I think there are other issues. For us in South Africa, the question of, of unemployment, access to food and poverty, has become some of the key issues. In the last days, uh, in my city, in Cape Town, we've seen a number of food riots. Young people, young women, so you can imagine the desperation, running into supermarkets, charging supermarkets, looting, coming out with baskets of food, and so on. So the question of access to food is a really a, a big challenge. And again, the difference between the urban, the urban rural divide, the, the challenges are equally uh, difficult. Um, for the rural women's assembly, the problems are many because to be able to go to your fields, to go and harvest, to go and plant, to go and water, you need a permit. And to access the permit is a problem. So the challenges of the moment, I think, um, uh, haven't been thought through well enough in, in my view. Our government, South African, the South African government, and many of the governments in Southern Africa have chosen the same model. So we have a model, a lockdown model, which says you've got to stay in your house. Now it's, easy to stay in your house, I can stay in my house. But if you're living in an informal uh, settlement, it's not so easy to stay in your house with 10 other people. If you're living in a village and you cannot access uh, water, you cannot access many basic things, it's not so easy to, to stay in your house. If um, for many women, the, issue, the way of accessing a livelihood is through the informal sector. How do you go and sell your produce? How do you go and sell the veg, the small amounts of money that you make from, the, from, from uh, this has become completely cut off. So now there is a greater dependence on, on the state um, to support um, poor people. Yesterday there was a, a, the government, um, announced a new package, uh, for a stimulus package. And for many of us, the stimulus package is, 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 a, is a big disaster. So there's been a big demand in South Africa for a basic income grant. What the package is offering is 350 rand per unemployed person per month. We have over 40% unemployed people. I'm not sure how they're going to get uh, 350 Rand, which is what? Maybe it's uh, 20 pounds per month. How are they going to get 20 pounds a month to poor people? 
the administrative burden of just delivering this is going to be uh, a problem. And so the crisis in South Africa is deepening, but the crisis in the region in Southern Africa is even worse because the health system is extremely fragile. In a country like uh, Swaziland, they do not even have a laboratory to test for COVID-19. So the dependence on the South African health system is extremely great. So we have an internal burden, and then we have the burden of the region. So we have a, uh, um, the, the fault lines of, a, of a, um, an industrial model is shown up uh, very, very well, very much uh, during this uh, uh, moment. We, we don't produce any medicines here in, in the region. We depend on China and we depend on India. So how now do we access some of these uh, vital medications that's required? So yesterday in a discussion with Rural Women's Assembly from uh, Zimbabwe, they were telling us that they're running out of maize meal. The shops don't have maize meal. And this is a crisis because this is a staple food. So throughout the region, the women are experiencing different problems. Um, I, the time, the 10 minutes is not enough to go into each of the country's specifics, but domestic violence in South Africa. Um, in two weeks ago already, um, the Minister of Police uh, announced that 87,000 um, there were 87,000 reports on, uh, at the various police stations across the country. This is a very uh, large number of, of people. So how do we uh, work in this moment? How do we support? How do we build solidarity when the, 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 the way in which the, the, um, the response is being organized calls for greater fragmentation, calls for greater uh, individualization. It calls for locking us up as opposed to building. And even the terminology, we must have social distancing. I mean, this is a problem to use such words. What we require is physical distancing, but we need greater, much more social solidarity. We need to think through what it is. This is a moment, I think, that we, as the popular movements, the radical movements, uh, must uh, build solidarity to think through, to open the questions, and to begin to, to have the debate about an alternative system of health care. We need to re-look uh, um, at the food systems. How do we grow food? How do we reconceptualize work and care, etc. So this is a, an important moment for us as women's organizations, as the feminist movement, to begin to deal uh, um, strategically with these questions and to think how we will fight at another level. So I think this is um, quite uh, important. And some, for me, the issue is not about physical in our country the terminology is used wash your hands and have social distancing we are saying there's a difference between physical distancing and we understand the health implications of physical distancing but social distancing is not the same as physical distancing we need much more uh, to think how we can collaborate so i think my 10 minutes is up thank you Yes, uh, thank you, Mersha. I'm sure that uh, in the Q&A, there will be a lot of questions on that. And at the same time, the, about the challenge of organizing and mobilizing 
South Africa is one of a country with the most one of the most dynamic social movements, and it is difficult to imagine now how organizing is done, how mobilizing people could not toy toy on the street to protest exactly, um, exactly. about the way that the government is handling the situation and 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 how they are responding to the situation. Uh, for those that would have questions and and or put or wanted to put comments, you can you are you are welcome to put that on the chat. There's also a Q&A section. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A. You can also post questions directly to the speaker, or if you want both of them to address that, you can also put that there. So unfortunately, Jean is having problems with her video. So she will join us with, um, with just a sound. Uh, and and um, I think that, would, that is still okay, considering uh, that we do uh, value the, um, the, 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 the briefing that we can get from the Philippines. So Jean Enriquez is the Executive Director of the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, Asia Pacific, and at the same time, the National Coordinator of World March of Women in the Philippines. She's a grassroots feminist movement. Uh, she works with the grassroots feminist movement campaigning against capitalism and patriarchy for a long time now. She started life as an activist against the Marcos dictatorship since she was 13 and has helped build alliances of social movements among workers, farmers, women, youth, indigenous in the urban and the rural poor. So it's great to have you, Jean. You have the mic now. And everyone, can you hear me well? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for having me. And I'm happy to be here to be able to join you in behalf of the World March of Women in the Philippines and also, uh, well, I can say perhaps the rest of the world. Uh, but I will be focusing on the situation in the Philippines. Um, similar to what Marcia has shared earlier, the most vulnerable women in the society are, of course, most affected, especially economically, by the crisis and also the resulting um, lockdown as a policy by the government. So the most affected groups of women are the informal workers, the daily wage earners, and most of them can be considered as urban poor women as well who are living in the, uh, in the slums of, the, of Metro Manila and other parts of Luzon. There are also the indigenous women whose uh, territories are currently being uh, entered into by uh, mining companies, even if they have put up barricades. And then, of course, the migrants who are likely to be brought back to the Philippines without clear programs for them coming from our own government. We have also been helping in the last uh, two years or more the widows of the victims of extrajudicial killings uh, and this was a result of the war on drugs, the bloody war on drugs of the Duterte administration. We are also helping women who have been trafficked to prostitution. So economically, as I've said, they are most affected because the government did not have safety net. When they announced the lockdown in Metro Manila, which was subsequently expanded to the rest of Luzon. But we also know that other parts of the Philippines are under the same uh, policy, so there's limited movement. And therefore, the earnings of, uh, of these women have been limited. Um, but as I have said, uh, other than that, the women are doubly burdened. For example, women who have been in uh, in the urban poor areas or who have been trafficked to prostitution are also re-victimized because some of the police in the checkpoints have been taking advantage of these women. So we have documented cases of women being uh, victimized in prostitution by police officers and also by soldiers. The general characteristic of the lockdown in the Philippines is it's definitely very militarized. So there are numerous cases of human rights violations, even of killings of uh, very poor people who are trying to cross checkpoints. In relation to pre-existing conditions, 
uh, this situation has been exacerbated, of course, by neoliberal policies uh, that has been there even before the pandemic has uh, happened. The reduced budget on health does not help uh, because our health system uh, is heavily privatized. We have seen that many patients are incurring bills into the millions. So the poor are really very scared that they will be infected by the virus, uh, more especially because they could not afford to be brought to the hospitals. Uh, but even the entire health system could not absorb the, the patients or what is categorized here as uh, persons under monitoring or persons under investigation if they have been uh, possibly exposed to those who have been infected by the virus. So the entire health uh, system in the Philippines is just in disarray, uh, to say the least, uh, because of the, of the privatization. There's also food shortage. There's very clear food shortage because even before the pandemic um, arrived, there's massive land conversion in the rural areas. I think everyone's now rebooting and um, rejoining us. So we were interrupted while Jean was um, sharing about the situation in the Philippines, which is, uh, which is really uh, very alarming because um, the government of, of, uh, of, um, of, the, of the Rodrigo Duterte is treating the situation like under a martial law period. And for many of us who have been under martial law, both Jean and I grew up under martial law period. It's the same way of, of, of management and handling that the government is doing now. Instead of treating it as a health uh, problem, they're treating it as a military and police problem. Um, from the reports that I'm seeing, both from postings of friends and the news, a lot of people due to lockdown not, are not just losing their, their access to livelihood, but many of them who still have jobs, including those in the frontline um, health services, are now walking to, to their work every day. So there are, there are reports of nurses, doctors, um, hospital attendants, um, uh, those who are cooking and cleaning the hospital are also having difficulty going to, going to work every day and treating patients because of the lockdown. And uh, if that is happening in the urban setting or in the, in the national capital region in Manila, we could only imagine the difficulty as well uh, of the situation in the countryside. So we are trying to get Jean back. Um, meanwhile, we 97, almost one, okay, 100 of the participants managed to, to turn back, uh, to zoom back again. And uh, we appreciate your perseverance. Yes, we need resilience at this time. Um, we need resilience also against both technology and, and the situation and the challenges we are facing. So maybe while, while we're still waiting for Jean to reconnect um, so as not to lose time, um, I just also wanted to, to flag some of the campaigns that we are not doing. Apart, as you can imagine also, we could not organize our meetings, um, our small group events um, in various cities in, in the UK. So we're also resorting to webinars, interviews, and, um, and, and Zoom meetings. Um, there are also two campaigns that we are doing at the same time, apart from these webinars and on different topics. We are trying to, uh, we have two signature campaigns that are going on. Uh, the first one is uh, to make COVID-19 vaccine affordable to all, for all. Uh, so we have a letter addressed to the UK Secretary of State for Health and Social Care and Secretary of State for International Development. So we are, um, you can go to our website and, and, and support that signature campaign, uh, put in your name, because we think, and we, we, not just think, we believe, we strongly believe that um, at the moment, until a vaccine is found, we will all be, or, uh, or develop, we will all be under lockdown. And once that there is a vaccine, that we fear that um, the, that might be uh, another uh, trade war. Uh, as we can see, there will be a monopoly of 
of who will produce it and who can get it. So we wanted that um, people who need it, um, especially those or everyone should have access to it. So join us in that campaign and put on your, um, include your signature to the many signatures that we've already collected. Another signature um, campaign that we are running at the moment together with Jubilee Debt is to a campaign to drop the debt of developing countries to save lives. Um, as you can imagine, as what Marisha and, and Jean have already mentioned, the challenges faced by the Global South, by, by poor and developing countries are enormous. There are problems not just on health, but also on facilities, on food, on everything. Um, and at the same time, they are burdened by automatic repayment of, of the foreign debt uh, owed to the international financial institutions. So those money, instead of being paid back to those banks, and many of those debts are odious and not, will not benefit the majority of the population, those money should be spent for massive scale out of health budgets to fight the coronavirus crisis. So Jane um, also put up the, the link for that. So please join us in that signature campaign as well. So now we have Jean back, um, but maybe uh, the rest of what Jean will, will also present um, can be included in the questions. So at this point, um, I would like to open the Q&A part of this, um, of this webinar. And I will just make sure that, that and, and Jean can also bear in mind to add uh, the rest of her presentation when there are questions addressed to her. So at the moment, we have five questions. I hope to have at least two to three uh, series of uh, cluster of questions. So the, the first question, of course, which is um, actually the kind of question we like a lot is, what can we do in the UK to raise awareness of the awful situation in the Philippines? Um, um, and also that's addressed to Jean. And, and for both uh, speakers, um, can you campaign for universal health care? We need free health care for all. And also, in Europe, uh, so much organizing has moved online during the lockdown, but some of our most vulnerable communities are not online. And you can imagine that's the same in, in the developing countries. So in the experiences of South Africa, how are you overcoming this? And I, I, I think also Jean can say a lot about that. So I think I will stop there and give the time. And I think for, for now, we'll call Jean first. And then also you can add, uh, maybe some of these questions you're meant to, uh, to address in your presentation. So, Jean? Jean, can you hear me? Okay, uh, she's having problem with with her audio. Uh, okay, the questions I'm just repeating. Um, so how, from what you have mentioned about the situation in the Philippines, how can we here in the UK raise awareness of the awful situation in the Philippines? What can we do here um, to, um, to partner with you, with your organization and the social movements in the Philippines? And then also for both of you, um, is there a campaign for universal health care. I think everywhere else there's a need for free health care for all. And then also how you how are you overcoming this is again for both of you, how are you overcoming the uh, problems, the digital divide also and the problems um, of vulnerable communities do, that do not have access um, online and to do things like this. So how are you addressing that? So that's both for you and for Marcia. So Jean, can you respond now? Hi, uh, I'm glad to be back. Um, clearly, the uneven online accessibility access, access is uh, very, uh, very evident here. Um, okay, so how can um, our friends in the UK be in solidarity with us? It's very important for us that we you join us in our call to delimit or demilitarize the COVID response. We have been pushing for a rights-based uh, and comprehensive COVID response that it's not, uh, it's, it should be about 
uh, protecting frontline workers, but it should also be about protecting the people in general, especially the most vulnerable among the people. And this would include the women, the indigenous, the LGBT, uh, the victims of uh, sexual exploitation and others. So we hope that our call to demilitarize the response uh, will resonate globally. Uh, we are also calling for universal health care. We are also calling for uh, income guarantees, but eventually we're hoping it will be universal basic income. Uh, the divide between classes has been very glaring in the last few months. Um, so it's very important uh, that we respond to this and be able to um, we hope that globally uh, our comrades will be able to join us in pushing for uh, support for the most vulnerable because uh, even us in uh, the World March of Women, particularly my group, the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women Asia Pacific, had to do relief operations. We have been going to the most vulnerable areas uh, and bringing food packs and other necessities such as medicines to the people. Um, so perhaps uh, support ca can be channeled towards that, to, towards ensuring also that the most vulnerable uh, continues to live be because this has been a question of survival for, for the most vulnerable among our women, among our people. Um, and of course, a stop to the mining operations uh, many have been hurt in the barricades when uh, the military took advantage of the of this militarized response to the crisis. As I was saying earlier, when they uh, intruded into the territorial uh, indigenous territories. So those are the some of the calls. But we have a very long statement that we can also share with our networks uh, internationally on how we can um, introduce also stru structural changes as we are undergoing this uh, major, major crisis. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mersha, do you want to? Yes, so I think um, this moment globally has shown us the importance of not only calling for a universal health care, but also to ensure that we um, get the health services back uh, equalized and to make sure that health becomes part of the commons all and everybody across from the rural urban should have the same access to health and to decent health care, good health care. And I think this is a key issue. And over the last period, we've seen how our governments and neoliberalism have slanted health budgets across the world. I think this is a moment to fight back and to insist that we rebuild uh, the health uh, system. I also, this, the way in which uh, the divide has been between public health and primary health, and I think this is another critical issue. How do we ensure that primary health care is available, et cetera, et cetera. And I suppose for us in, in South Africa and in Southern Africa, uh, this is not the first time we face, of course, the pandemic is different, but we've also had to deal with HIV and AIDS. We have an ongoing battle with TB. It's been um, with us. And in the region, we have Ebola, etc. So we have a, a health a burden in the region that is extremely heavy that I think requires a strong political uh, and united coordinated response. So I agree fully, this is the moment to challenge and to reconceptualize. The second issue for me is about the military. As I've said, we have um, quite a large number of people who've also been killed in South Africa already. Um, 
where the military has come into our townships, into the communities, and have um, shot at people. Several people have been killed. I think seven or nine um, people have already been killed. So um, there's a lot of fears. And yesterday, as part of the president's announcement, he's just made the point that 70,000 troops will be on our streets and more so for me this is quite a concerning issue because if we cannot win people to understand the issue if we cannot work with civil society there's just no way we can get the military to enforce it we will have a second uh maracana we'll have much more uh, chaos on our streets and we already have a great deal of chaos so the response of the military I think it's a universal issue that we should all deal with as well. So that's for me the second thing. The, the third issue which I think is critical is the divide that is becoming more and more um, pronounced. And I'm sure, um, Jean, you will know this also in the Philippines. The divide between rural communities, poor communities, who have no access to internet or all the facilities that we have. So we become the spokespeople and we begin to substitute for the poor because we have the resources. So I can talk, sit here now and talk as NGOs on behalf of the, the popular movements, etc., etc. And for me, this is also something that we must be conscious of and that we must fight against. Because um, as an activist, I don't want an NGO, um, sometimes we would say NGO wankers to talk on my behalf. Uh, the movements can speak and we must create the conditions and we must call for data to fall. We must make sure that people have access to all these things so that we can be begin to build new tools of resistance. And that's what this moment calls for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mersha. I think I will I'll also summarize some of the questions here because um, I'm, I'm uh, conscious that we're also running out of time with the interruption. But ma majority of the questions are also asking um, how, how are, well, there's also a question on maternity services. How is it being affected by the crisis? Um, I think the question on the internet has, has been addressed and and also on the informal settlement. So maybe both of you can elaborate on that more. And Jean, can, Jean there's a question about um, the street children. How are they being cared for? Um, in the UK, what is also amazing is that some of the things that are deemed impossible is now being done because the, before there's a lot of, of uh, homeless people and now with the crisis, uh, we see less of them. So, so all of a sudden, the local councils have found ways to, to, to put up homes for them. So is that also happening in the developing countries, in both the Philippines and South Africa? Um, and I think the next question I want both of you to address, which, which you have partly said uh, earlier, or addressed earlier in your presentation, is how do activists build the networks of solidarity to counter the isolation and I think at this point you can also involve, you can also say something about how do we build internationalism? How do we build global solidarity? Um, I think both the Philippines and South African movements are quite strong on that. Many activists in both countries have very internationalist approach and attitude towards movement building. So, so can you can you say something on those on those issues, uh, Jean? Yeah, tomorrow we will be marking the seventh commemoration of the Rana Plaza tragedy. So it is one way that we are organizing among them, among ourselves. We are going to have an online campaign um, condemning transnational crimes. Um, and we will be highlighting uh, various aspects of transnational um, crimes, not only in relation to labor, but as uh, in, in other sectors that I've mentioned, such as mining, such as health, um, and others. So we will go online and we'll be posting our calls 
uh, for accountability of transnational corporations. We continue to also uh, organize through tele, what we call tele-trainings. So in mo many rural areas, they don't have access to the internet, so we are using cell phone. Uh, it's quite ironic, but almost everyone has a cell phone, has a mobile here, uh, however cheap it is. Uh, but so, so we are able to conduct uh, long distance trainings on how we can continue to respond to cases of violence against women at the community level. So we are um, updating the skills also of our organizers in the rural areas to be able to respond in a survivor-centered and gender-responsive manner to that. Which brings me to the question on people in the streets. I'm saying people in general because not only are the children not helped, but even the adult women. Uh, just yesterday when we were communicating with them because we tried to send cash online uh, for them to be able to send uh, to be able to buy their necessities in areas where we could not go physically uh, we try to send uh, somehow funds to small budget to the women and uh, these women have been running away from the police so they were panting when we were calling them when we were talking to them because the police uh, had been chasing them so they were able to go to a safe spot to be able to, to talk to us. So many of them remain in the streets, but uh, people's organizations are <clears throat> able to reach them uh, to be able to send uh, either money or food for their basic necessities. So unlike in the North, uh, there's still no help for people in the streets. Uh, instead, what's happening is that they're being harassed. As I've said, they're being sexually exploited uh, by both the police and the military. So it's kind of overwhelming here, but we, as much as possible, uh, try to reach them. And we are organizing among women's groups to be able to get our act together and be able to help as much who are most vulnerable, both in the urban and in the rural areas. And I agree with one of the calls that I've read here that it's important to call for debt cancellation. Currently, our government, however, keeps on borrowing uh, from China and has been taking advantage of the crisis that tends to overwhelm um, activists. Uh, that's why it's very important for us to keep track of what the government has been doing uh, to take advantage of the situation, such as increased borrowings, such as continuing incursions in islands uh, of the Philippines, the, uh, the selling out of our islands uh, specifically to China by our own government. So that is something that we also have to push back against while we are also minding the survival of our people. Uh, Marcia, perhaps? Yes, to split the, so I think the issue you raise about building global platforms is quite key. And I think the issue um, Jean also speaks to it that you've raised is the question of debt. And all our governments are already debt ridden and it's, they're going to have to go back to the World Bank and the IMF and so this is an issue that we've got to, to use and build, rebuild the debt campaign um, of uh, many years ago. The second issue is health. I think we need to begin a platform that calls for um, the nationalization of, of health. We cannot continue to have private hospitals. At the, and medical aids, et cetera, that only provides for some. And when there is a crisis, if you have a medical aid in South Africa, I can go onto a ventilator before you, um, Darty, if you don't have a medical aid. So this type of, we, we need to just break through. This is a key issue. Um, we have done some, um, some interesting things. The mobile phone is quite critical. And as you know, South Africans like to sing and to make songs. So we've 
used songs uh, quite a lot to raise issues of how to uh, make sanitizers and how to um, how to spread our messages through songs that we could put on box pops and send it out via the phones. So there's been lots of, I think, innovative uh, ways of trying to work and organize in this moment. But I think we are slow in shifting. We're used to organizing in a particular way and we understand power in a particular way. So how now do we begin to challenge power in this new configuration where we are not able to go into the streets, march to parliament, occupy a building? So how do we work now? And I think that's part of what the new period must allow us uh, to think through and to collectively work out how we're going to, to um, yeah, work. Uh, in this in this moment, like how do we challenge the military? Yeah, so yeah, I just wanted to clarify what Jean was saying about Rana Plaza. That was the the case in Bangladesh of a huge building collapse and uh, hundreds of of migrant women who are um, garment workers died in in that event. That was uh, I think several years ago. And um, there are many campaigns on that. Um, also on the question on the chat about the TNCs, we're also um, partnering with, um, with, with um, the global campaign to stop transnational corporations and impunities and, and uh, running a campaign uh, for a UN binding treaty on transnational corporations. You can also access that information in our website. Um, there are, I will continue with one more uh, cluster of questions. Um, there, there is a question here about um, how, well, it was on the chat version, but, but um, that the Jean already mentioned. What are the forces or what are the sectors that are opposing Duterte? Um, what are the stance of the church? What are the, what are, what, what can be done against the police and the military that beat up people? In both South Africa and, and, and the Philippines, actually, there are cases of, of soldiers uh, just uh, using guns, um, again, when, when they are scared that people are, are getting in uncontrollable. Um, I was, uh, I, I learned this morning that 75,000 soldiers were deployed in Johannesburg to prevent riots. So how is that being faced by social movements? Um, there is also a question about, uh, again for Jean, the question on, um, um, well, I think I can, I can respond to this. The Filipino communities in the UK involved in campaigning to help people in the Philippines. There are a lot of solidarity groups of people uh, living here, Filipinos living in the UK. And some of them are, uh, many of them are organized on regional Base as well. So the Philippines is, is um, an archipelago, archipelago. There are a lot of, of groups that speak the same language, come from the same area. Many of those are organized in a way to help their provinces. So there are those that are, that are organized for that. Um, and there are also uh, help coming from, from NGOs and, and solidar campaign solidarity groups that are dealing with those questions. Um, I wanted to come back again on the question, maybe both for Jean and for Mersha, on the on the social isolation. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, it's it's physical isolation that we we should do. But again, I will I will come back on the question of of um, how is it being overcome in both your countries? That as we as you mentioned in the in the shack dwellers do not have the um, the luxury of space. You have five, six people living in, 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 a, in a small square as a household. Uh, and then when they go out to venture out for fresh air or to get food, they are being arrested. So how, how is that being addressed in both your countries? Well, um, it's, a, it's a very big problem. And the government has uh, said, and it's, uh, it's amazing the point you made earlier, how they can find solutions today that yesterday was unthinkable. 
but now they are talking about uh, finding accommodation for the elderly to put people into decent uh, facilities and so on. This is, this is today it's mainly been um, talk. We haven't seen any real uh, shift happening. They are also saying they'll move, uh, make more land and facilities available for people to, to move to. We haven't seen that either. Instead, we've seen people occupying land now during this period, and we've seen um, the police, or what we call here in South Africa, the red ants going to um, break down these uh, facilities, even though there's supposed to be a moratorium on evictions. Uh, four weeks ago, there was a moratorium called on evictions, but it's still continuing. And I think it's one of the issues that we are taking up and we are um, mobilizing around. We've had a, um, we've taken legal action and we've gotten a court order to prevent evictions of farm workers and farm dwellers from uh, commercial farms. Um, I think the issue of the military is something that we're going to talk about in the next days. Um, it's, it's, a big, it's a big problem because we have a government um, that's not able to win uh, the hearts and minds of people in the campaign now. And so the military is on the streets and forcing people at gunpoint into, into their homes. Jean? It's a huge challenge uh, because especially in a central island in the Philippines, there are more cases that are turning out to be positive and even in prisons. But there's no significant movement uh, that's coming from the government to uh, transport for example, those in jail to other places or to release them temporarily. And even if there are recommendations for the urban poor people who tested positive to be moved to, uh, to bigger places, there are no such uh, significant changes in their conditions as of yet. So many of uh, social movement uh, activists, as well as uh, health uh, experts have been giving recommendations on how to protect those who are infected, as well as the people in general. But uh, the government continues to be hiding the real numbers. Uh, in terms of cases uh, here in the Philippines. So it's really very difficult because the Duterte government has been following the China model that's been covering up information on uh, the real situation of the crisis and tends to give rosy picture. Uh, of the situation rather than really confronting the problem and making significant uh, changes uh, to be able to deal with the enemy, with the virus itself, and to be able to protect the people in general. So we just keep on pushing and keep on asking for real information, for, for the truth. And also we keep on releasing almost on a daily basis our uh, recommendations on how we can protect everyone, the frontline workers, those who are uh, who, those who tested positive, and also the people in general, not only from the virus but also from starvation. So it's a daily struggle here. So we really feel as activists that we have more work now under the lockdown situation than we have had uh, before. Thank you, Jean. Um, at this point, I would like to announce as well that uh, this, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar is a fortnightly event um, that we are organizing. And in fact, the next webinar is already 
um, is, will already be posted by Jane on the chat on the chat box. We are preparing and organizing for that, and the next topic will be on the on the access to vaccine and treatments. So how do we fight how do we fight for global access uh, for COVID nineteen vaccine and treatment? So for if you want to join us, um, go to the to that link and, and register and, and again share it to people that you think would be interested to join that. Um, I think at this point I would like to give both Mersha and and Jean one last minute to if you want to announce something or last messages that you wanted to share with our participants and also um, uh, for everyone pay attention to the chat as well uh, both our speakers and and Jane are posting links on that on the chat box so maybe last one last words uh, for from both Mersha and Jean and I think uh, Mersha maybe you want to go first well, I think I want to start off by saying thank you for the conversation. Thank you for allowing us to, to share. Uh, it's a very challenging moment, but it's going to allow us to think through and think differently about many things. And I think it's important, as all of us have said earlier, to use the time to win back some of what we've lost, like a decent healthcare system that's accessible to all. And these are some of the things that I think is going to be important mm -hmm. to build solidarity around. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mersha. Jean? Thank you also for this international platform. Um, we hope that we can be together in our call to resist authoritarianism, especially in countries like the Philippines, Brazil, and others were in um, the right-wing forces are taking advantage of uh, the policy of controlling the population amid the crisis. So uh, it should not be used as an excuse to deprive uh, the people of our fundamental rights. Instead, it's very important to call for people to speak up so that we can all contribute to fighting the virus. It's also important that we keep watch uh, of transnational corporations who are taking advantage as well of the crisis. So all forces that are in power are taking advantage, the author authoritarian right, the, the transnational corporations, especially mining companies. We also know the transnational corporations like Coke, for example, mm -hmm are uh, pushing workers to go to work without protection such that in the Philippines very recently um, a union has been charged with economic sabotage for not going to work uh, but they did not go to work because they don't have protection so it's also um, important to uh, resist uh, such uh, exploitation by TNCs and also by agri agribusiness um, as I have in somehow discussed earlier how they are taking advantage also of the of the pandemic um, and also to continue to build solidarity among women and among peoples around the world uh, around of course uh, these issues of uh, people's uh, rights that we have to defend uh, but more basic is people's survival, especially in the global south. So we hope that you can uh, continue to be in touch and uh, we'll let you know how else we can, uh, you can help us in the struggle over here. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you very much, Jean and Mersha. Those are really inspiring words. And, and as you've mentioned, we have a lot to do. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and, and we definitely, even if we're staying home, we're not being silenced. We will continue organizing and, and doing things like this that is allowed by the, by the limits. Uh, for those of you who are not yet a member of Global Justice Now, uh, you're free to do so. You can, you can also join us, as, uh, apart from supporting all those signatures, petitions that you have been putting your names on. Uh, please join us, support our campaigns, work with us, and 
Jane will also put the, the link on the chat box. So I think uh, on the chat box. Um, at this point, I would like to thank everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, again, apologies for the, the technical problems that we've been facing the whole hour. Um, indeed, the coronavirus crisis can only be tackled with people's sovereignty and environmental, social, gender, and economic justice. So um, stay tuned and, and um, yeah, join our succeeding um, webinars. And I hope that you take care. Bye-bye.